Good day. My name is David Wild, and this is the third part of a three-part lecture on Chapter 2 on the History of Management from Connect Master Management 2.0. Now let's talk about the human relations perspective of management. While the administrative and bureaucratic perspective emphasizes the structures and management principles that would enhance the effectiveness of organizations, another group of scholars, in what became known as the human relations perspective, recognized the complexity of human behavior and social relationships that exist within the organization. For human relations scholars, the key to improving organizations was to understand why people and groups of people act the way they do while they are at work. Leading figures in this tradition include Hugo Munsterberg, Mary Parker Follett, and Elton Mayo. Hugo Munsterberg has been called the father of applied or industrial psychology. He focused his research on psychological issues that existed in industry in order to inform management practices and policies. He used what is known as experimental psychology to examine whether individual differences in things like mental traits or abilities have implications for work-related processes and outcomes. Mary Parker Follett was also a leading thinker in the human relations perspectives. One of the key features and contributions of her work was a welcomed focus on the interaction of management and workers within organizational settings and a need to adopt a holistic or total view of management. One issue was the focus that organizational life is dynamic and involved constant change and adaptation. In this dynamic context, it is important to acknowledge and consider control, power, and authority relationships between managers and employees. A key feature of her work was the importance of coordination with employees and the value of participatory management rather than over-managing employees. One commonly referenced perspective of management attributed to Follett is that management is the art of getting things done through other people. Finally, Elton Mayo and the Hawthorne Studies. A major force in the behavior perspective was a series of studies conducted at the Hawthorne plant of the Western Electric Company in Chicago by Elton Mayo, Fritz Roethlisberger, and their colleagues. In one study, known as the Illumination Experiments, the researchers sought to understand the impact of change in lighting on workers in a factory. To see if lighting made a difference, they split the workers into groups, and in three of the four groups, the lighting conditions were changed to be lighter or darker. Interestingly, productivity increased for all four groups, even for the one with no change in lighting. The conclusion from this surprising finding is that it wasn't the lighting that mattered. Rather, it was that people were paying attention to the employees, and the employees were behaving differently because of this attention. This finding became known as the Hawthorne effect. In another study, the Relay Assembly Room study, the researchers examined the impact of variations in the workplace, i.e. the number and length of rest breaks, hours worked, on productivity by examining the impact of workplace changes among assemblers of telephone relays in the plant. Consistent with the first study, no matter what changes were introduced, productivity was found to incre have increased. One conclusion from this study is that employees valued participation and cooperation in the workplace, and that cooperative groups can lead to higher productivity. In another study called the Bank Wiring Room Study, the researchers observed a group of 14 men wiring switches for telephone equipment. The study was about how individual pay incentives impacted group productivity. Interestingly, they did not. Everyone completed the same level of work each day, possibly due to group pressure and fear the company would lower their pay if some workers produced more outputs. While there were differences in employee potential, 
Some could perform, could perform more. This finding uncovered the importance of group pressures. So in summary, looking at the human relations perspective, the human relations perspective of management focused less on the management of people within organizations and studied more on how people actually work within organizations. This grassroots or bottom-up approach studied how work was really done and then developed some critical considerations that serve as major issues in modern organizations. One major contribution of the human relations perspective is that even in the presence of managerial practices, the social and informal side of organizational life is ripe with activity. Finally, the importance of conflict, coordination, and group pressures emerged as major considerations in this era, thanks to the Hawthorne studies. And these remain key issues that many modern-day managers deal with on a regular basis. And now, let's look at some contemporary perspectives on management. Over the past 50 years, we have seen the emergence of several newer perspectives within the field of management. Some of these have parallels to earlier perspectives, while others explicitly challenge some of the key ideas of earlier management theories. Management science. A fundamentally different approach to management emerged in the middle of the 1900s. A major impetus for the growth of this approach was the research done during World War I that sought to understand how best to deploy hundreds of thousands of troops, materials, and supplies quickly around the globe. This work grew into what is called management science, a field of study that uses sophisticated mathematical and statistical models to account for a multitude of variables in order to improve decision-making in organizations. Total quality management is a managerial trend that gained substantial momentum in industry in the 1980s and 1990s. TQM represented a fundamental change in philosophy regarding how to improve product and service quality. A fundamental element of TQM is that there is commitment to quality throughout the production process. With TQM, every employee at every stage of the process is expected to strive to maximize quality. The founding father of this quality push was W. Edwards Deming, who worked with Japanese companies after World War II to help them rebuild their organizations and economy. Deming articulated 14 principles he believed were critical for the realization of a TQM approach within organizations. And you'll see Deming's 14 points listed in table two on your screen. The first of these principles was to create a consistency of purpose for improvement of products and services. Second, to adopt the new philosophy that mistakes and negativism should be unacceptable. Third, to cease dependence on mass inspection. Quality comes from improving the process not inspecting the output. Fourth, to end the practice of awarding business on price alone. Purchasing should focus on quality. Fifth, to improve constantly and forever the system of production and service. You need to always look to improve. Sixth, institute training on the job. Workers need to know how to work effectively. Seventh, institute leadership. This involves helping people to do a better job <clears throat> and helping those who need help. Eight, drive out fear. Employees should be allowed and encouraged to ask questions and raise concerns about problems they encounter. Nine, break down barriers between staff areas. You need to promote teamwork. Tenth, eliminate slogans, exhortations, and targets for the workplace. Eleven, eliminate numerical quotas. Quotas focus on volume, not quality. 12. Remove barriers to pride in workmanship. People often want to do a good job, but are discouraged. Number 13. Institute a vigorous program of education and retraining. People need to be kept up to date with new and improved technologies and approaches. 
And lastly, number 14, take action to accomplish this transformation and take the steps necessary to ensure success. Joseph Duran, a student of the scientific management era, combined that base of knowledge with ideas from the behavioral era and the Hawthorne studies to broaden the emphasis on quality throughout organizations. One of his best known contributions to management is the development of the Duran Trilogy. The Duran Trilogy highlights the need to think about quality from several points of view. First, quality planning. It is important to think about the features offered in a product or service from the customer's point of view. Secondly, quality control. Measure performance against standards to identify deficiencies. And lastly, quality improvement. Take steps to find the causes of the quality problems and take action to eliminate them from returning. Next in the contemporary perspectives, we have what is known as the systems perspective. Another relatively development in managerial thinking is the systems perspective. At a general level, this perspective recognizes that organizations function in an environment that must be considered when making decisions. As shown in figure three, which you see on your screen, organizations depend on inputs from the external environment, such as raw materials, labor, and financial investments. The transformation process within the organization takes the inputs and produces goods and services that are sold to end users. In turn, the outputs of the organization's tran transformational process influence the external environment. A second notable feature of organizations from a systems point of view is the notion of self-regulation. What this means is not only do organizations transform inputs into outputs through their transformation processes, but they also receive feedback from the environment to compete better and to adapt to unforeseen change. A key role of management is to be attuned to the external environment, to scan for opportunities and threats, and devise managerial strategies to align the organization with those opportunities. This view is very well accepted and is a key concept in strategic management. This is called a SWOT. Strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats analysis. Next, we have what is known as the contingency perspective. In 1960, Douglas McGregor proposed that different approaches of managing people are grounded in different assumptions and theories we have about what motivates people. On the one hand, Theory X presumes employees do not like to work and they tend to avoid responsibility. Therefore, their behavior at work needs to be actively directed and managed using coercion and control. On the other hand, Theory Y presumes employees have an innate desire to have autonomy and responsibility, and that they can contribute to the organization through participative and self-directed behavior. By 1970, however, management and organization scholars began to recognize that the effectiveness of the two approaches depends on several factors, including the nature of the work itself. Although though the idea that there is not one best way of managing people may seem obvious today, this was groundbreaking when first introduced, and it ultimately led to the contingency theories of management. At the most basic level, contingency theories propose that the relationship between a managerial practice, policy, or style, and some outcome, such as employee motivation or performance, depends on a contingency factor. Some of the more popular contingency factors examined include company size and years in business, business strategy, industry sector, technology, and the external environment. And the contingency perspective leads to a great management phrase that you can always remember and rely on in that the answer to any question is, it depends.
For a final subject, let's talk about knowledge management. Knowledge management refers to management's efforts to leverage information and intellectual capital within organizations. At a basic level, this often involves gathering information, organizing it, and sharing it with all relevant parties within and outside of the organization. At a broader level, this can be viewed as managing the, the knowledge people hold, human capital, the knowledge that is shared among individuals and in groups or organizations, social capital, and the knowledge that is retained by the organization in routines, databases, patents, manuals, structures, and processes. These are known as organizational capital. Although the importance of knowledge workers, employees who rely on their knowledge and who combine their knowledge with others to make job-related contributions, is widely recognized today, organizations are struggling to meet managerial challenges that accompany them. For example, when a knowledge worker quits the organization, their knowledge leaves with them. Project management is the systematic process of managing a work-related project from its inception to conclusion. A traditional approach to projects is a five-step process that encompasses initiation, planning and design, execution, monitoring and controlling, and lastly, completion and disbandment of the project team. Project managers allow an organization to focus on many separate projects at one time, while the organization attempts to achieve its overall objectives. So in summary, over the past 50 years, managers have advanced several new perspectives on management thinking. Some of these practices are logical extensions of earlier practices while others challenge the logic of earlier perspectives. TQM, or Total Quality Management, blends aspects of scientific management and administrative theory, as well as some behavioral perspectives to develop a new philosophy to maximize quality throughout the organizational system. The management science or quantitative approach relies on empirical and simulated data and mathematical and statistical models to aid managerial decision-making. Theory X presumes employees do not like to work and tend to avoid responsibility. And Theory Y presumes employees have an innate desire to have autonomy and responsibility and contribute to the organization through participative and self-directed behavior. Contingency theories challenge the notion that either Theory X or Theory Y is the one best way to motivate employees but instead propose that the best way to motivate employees depends on contingency factors, such as the nature of the work. One of the more recent advances in the practice of management is the increased attention placed on knowledge management, which refers to management's efforts to leverage information and intellectual capital within organizations. Finally, project management is the systematic process of managing a work-related project from its inception to conclusion and consist of five steps. First, initiation. Second, planning and design. Third, execution. Fourth, monitoring and controlling. And fifth, completion and disbandment of the project team. And that concludes our lecture on the history of management.